In this video, I'm going to explain how you determine the regularity and the rate on an EKG strip using just a few very simple techniques. Hang around because I'm getting started right now. All right, so this is the third episode in this EKG interpretation course. I'm gonna put the links to the first two episodes in the description below if you haven't seen those already. Check them out. In those first two episodes, I focus mostly on the basic principles and the foundational knowledge that you need to be able to interpret 12 lead EKGs thoroughly. Today, we're going to jump into some actual EKG interpretation. Remember this image from an earlier episode? Well, we're going to be applying this concept of the R to R interval quite a bit today. By the end of this episode, you're going to be able to have all the skills and knowledge you need to be able to interpret an EKG down to and identify the basic arrhythmias. Like I talked about, we're going to talk about regularity and rate. Let's get started with regularity first. Now to determine the regularity of an EKG strip, um, in my opinion, it's usually easier to look at lead two, but you can really use any lead. Lead two just usually, for the most part, gives really nice distinct R waves or QRS complexes. So it sometimes is the easiest, but you can really use any lead. So what we do to identify the regularity or determine if this rhythm is regular or irregular, we need to look at the R to R interval and see if it is consistently the same length or the same duration in time. We can do this either using EKG calipers, which look a little bit like a, a compass tool, okay? Uh, but an even simpler method is a paper pencil method. I'm gonna demonstrate that to you here in just a second. But basically what we're trying to determine when we're determining regularity is, is this rhythm on the EKG regular? Meaning it marches out consistently. Is it regularly irregular? And I'll show you what that means here in a minute. Or is it irregularly irregular? Okay, so I'll specify the differences here. So let me take a minute and explain and show you on an actual EKG what this looks like using the paper pencil method, which is the method I've always used. First of all though, on this 12 lead, you can see that we have uh, lead one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. However, you can see down below we have V1 again, V2 again, and V5 again. So this EKG printer was programmed to not just print the 12 leads for, you know, a couple of seconds or 1.5 seconds and then 1.5 seconds, 1.5 seconds, and 1.5 seconds to make the six seconds, but also for uh, help with interpretation, we've got V1, lead two and V5 running for the full six seconds so that we can use this for rhythm strip. It makes it a little easier for interpretation because we can look at this now and determine over that six seconds was there, was it identical with each cardiac cycle for the full six seconds in that same lead. So let's, let's use lead two since it's a simple rhythm strip. And in this case, for the paper method, I'm simply going to use just a post-it note, okay? I'm going to rip this and uh, tear this, excuse me, fold this in half. This is literally how simple it is. Now I've got my paper and uh, pencil method. So I'm going to put the very corner right here at the peak of this R wave and mark the next one. And that's as simple as it is. So now I go the next cycle. R to R is identical, R to R is identical, R to R identical. So in this case, this is regular. It marches out perfectly. For regular rhythms, the R to R interval is the same. It consistently marches out in the same duration of time. This is obviously a normal finding. If a patient is in normal sinus rhythm, meaning their heart rate is in that normal being paced by the sinus node rhythm, then the R to R interval should be consistent. They should be regular. In order to make the determination of normal sinus rhythm, you have to have a regular R to R interval. That being said, it's really important to understand that a lot of the arrhythmias we're going to talk about, including some of the potentially life-threatening arrhythmias, are regular in nature as well. So just because a rhythm is regular does not mean it's not a problem. 
So here's an example of normal sinus rhythm, and let's use that pa uh, the paper pencil method uh, that I showed you just a moment ago to see if this is truly regular. So here's our little piece of paper, there's our post-it note, and if you see we've got an R to R interval marked about right here. And if we move this over onto the next cycle, you can see that it's the same distance, it's the same duration of time. And if we were to follow that all the way across, the R to R intervals march out, so we do in fact have a regular rhythm. This is what a regular rhythm looks like on a 12 lead EKG. In this case, it's a little bit fast. It's a little bit of a sinus tachycardia. There are other things going on here too that we'll get into in future episodes. But if you look at the R to R interval, especially down here in the lead two that's being used as a rhythm strip, you can see that this R to R interval does in fact march out consistently. So this is what we would call a regular rhythm. Now, regularly irregular. Okay, a little bit of a confusing concept sometimes, but it, it's we don't want to make it more confusing than it really is. If a rhythm is regularly irregular, then what that means is the R to R interval is not constant. It doesn't map. It doesn't march out consistently like we saw with normal sinus rhythm or sinus tachycardia. But the overall underlying pattern or the underlying rhythm is regular. So a great classic example of this are certain types of AV blocks or AV nodal blocks. We'll talk about these in a future episode when we talk about conduction defects. But notice here in our example on the screen that the R to R interval is not constant. Notice we've got this R to R interval which is obviously shorter than this R to R interval. Okay, but if we were to measure, we'd say this R to R interval is the same as this one and this one. So what's going on here? It, this is an example of a certain type of AV block or a conduction defect that we'll talk about in the future. Um, and we're missing a QRS complex and T wave here. So there's an underlying pattern that is regular, even though our R to R interval is not regular. So we can classify that technically as regularly irregular. It's not hugely important for diagnostic purposes, but you'll see these. Here's an example of a regularly irregular uh, 12 lead EKG. Again, this is uh, an example of an AV block, but you can see that the underlying rhythm is consistent, but we're dropping QRSs every once in a while, so it's not perfectly regular either. All right, irregularly irregular now. So if we're going to call something irregularly irregular, or I squared, uh, the R to R interval is not constant and nothing else is really constant either. There's really no consistency throughout, there's no true underlying pattern. The classic example of this is atrial fibrillation. AFib is not the only arrhythmia that has an irregularly irregular regularity, but it's the most common one and it's the classic example. So notice here in our uh, rhythm strip here on the screen, if we're gonna use our paper method, there you go, we've got our, our post-it note there and we're gonna draw uh, this R to R interval marks out right there. Now if we move this over, we can see that we definitely do not line up. We've got our R to R interval not matching. Move over again, again we're missing the mark, and move over again, we're missing the mark, but we've got three different locations. So there is no regularity to this. The R to R interval is anything but constant and consistent. So we're gonna go ahead and call this irregularly irregular. As you can see, here's a 12 lead example of an irregularly irregular pattern or, or regularity. And you can see again down in our bottom, the rhythm strip going along the bottom is lead two. And you can see that R to R intervals are definitely not marching out. And if you look in all of the different leads, we don't see anything that consistently looks like a P wave. So this, we would be very safe to call this atrial fibrillation. There, again, like I mentioned, there are other arrhythmias that have an irregularly irregular pattern to them, but AFib is the most common and classic example. All right, so that's regularity. Let's change gears now and get into determining heart rate. Again, a little caveat here that I've mentioned in the past in a previous episode is that we're not trying to find the patient's pulse, right? A pulse is something we are able to palpate and feel like the radial pulse here or a carotid pulse. That's how we can determine a pulse rate. It is a way of measuring the patient's heart rate, but if we're measuring it on an EKG, let's not call it a pulse rate. It's a heart rate, okay? Now, uh, generally, again, it's gonna work best if we're looking in something like lead two, but that's not always the case. You can really use any lead, anything that clearly gives you nice R, R waves so that you can use that R to R interval again to determine the rate. 
There are two very simple methods to be able to determine the patient's heart rate. One is called the big box method, or sometimes called the 300, 150, 100 method. It's easier to just say big box method. And then the second one is the six second method. Both of these are accurate methods in order to determine the patient's heart rate, but there are a couple important caveats that we need to be able to understand. For example, we cannot use the big box method if the patient's heart rate is not regular. If the patient's in an irregularly irregular pattern, the 300, 150, 100 method or big box method is not going to be accurate and we need to use the six second method. We can technically use the six second method anytime though, but sometimes it's nice and faster to be able to determine their heart rate using the big box method, but only if they're in that regular pattern. All right, so there are some basic important things we need to understand when we're determining the patient's heart rate about the way the grid paper works with an EKG. So remember this drawing from one of the earlier episodes? So remember, one millimeter across this horizontal axis, which is duration of time in seconds, right? One millimeter is 1 25th of a second, five big boxes or five millimeters is 0.2 seconds. And that also means that five big boxes equals one second of time. And if then if we count out 30 big boxes, 30 big boxes is six seconds in time. Okay, so these important things to understand as we move forward in our discussion of the two methods to determine the patient's heart rate. So I'm going to mark here with a little star that little line there important concept to remember moving forward. All right, so let's talk about this big box method first, okay? Again, like I mentioned a few seconds ago, it's really important to understand you can only use this method if the heart rate is regular. That's why the first step in interpreting an EKG is to determine if it's regular or irregular. If it's regular, then in step two, the heart rate, you can use this big box method to determine the, the heart rate. So knowing that 300 big boxes equals a full minute of time, uh, we can apply this big box method in the following ways. So what you wanna do first is find a QRS peak or an R wave, whether it's a, it doesn't matter if it's the S way, a deep S wave or the R wave, but generally find a nice R wave that lands right on one of the big dark lines, right on a, a, the line of a big box. Okay, then what you want to do is look down the duration of time and see when, when the next QRS segment lands. Okay, so that find the next QRS peak. If the next QRS peak is one big box over, then the heart rate is 300 beats per minute. Okay, one big box over, 300 beats per minute. If it's two big boxes over, 150 beats per minute. If it's three big boxes over, we're gonna call it 100 beats per minute. If it's four dark lines over or four big boxes over, then the heart rate is 75 beats per minute. If it's five big boxes over, then we're going to call it 60 beats per minute. If we go one more over, so six lines out, it would be about 50 beats per minute. That being said, once you get to about five to six big boxes over, it would probably be a little safer and, and maybe even more accurate to just simply use the six second method. So let me quickly show you here. So we've got some EKG paper. Let's say our, our uh, R-wave peak that lands on a dark line is right here, okay? And so we say, well, we're gonna count over and see where our next QRS complex would land. If it were landing right there on the next one over, it would be 300 beats per minute. If it were here, 150, here, 100, here, 75, here, 60 beats per minute. So I think you get the idea. Let me go ahead and demonstrate that quickly on an actual EKG. Now, the very first thing you wanna do with the big box method is look across your EKG, find one of the QRS complexes or a nice R wave peak that happens to land right on, on a big line. Okay, right on one of your darker lines like this one. Notice how that one lands right on one of our dark lines as opposed to you know this one which is somewhere out in the middle. So I, I always kind of scan, try to find that one, uh, one that lands right on a line or nearest to it. And then we simply count over. This would be 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, and we can keep going from there, but notice we don't have to because in this situation, we've got our next R wave occurring just 
on the other side of 100. So in this case, the patient's heart rate is right around 90 beats per minute using this big box method. So on this EKG, I wanna show you something important. Notice this patient's EKG is irregularly irregular. The R waves do not march out in a regular fashion. For that, for that reason, we cannot use the 300 method or the big box method. We have to use the six second method. But I wanna show you why, why this does not work if the patient's EKG is not regular. So notice here, here's a, an R wave that lands right on one of our dark lines. We've got our next one over would be 300 our next one over being 150, and this one occurred right before it. So if we just used this R to R interval, we might call this patient's rate somewhere in the realm of you know, 180 beats per minute. But notice if we were to use, uh, for example, this one, it occurs, this QRS complex occurs right before the dark line. So we're gonna go over one box, 300, go over another box, 150, go over another box, which is 100, and this happens to fall below 150. So if we use this R to R interval, we might call this more like 130, and there's a big difference between 130 and 180. So this is why we don't want to use the big box method if the patient's rhythm is not regular. One more quick example then, let's go ahead and use this regular rhythm. Uh, this QRS happens to land right on a dark line, 300, 150, this happens to be just below it. Now if the next R to R interval, excuse me, the next R wave landed right here on the next big box, then this patient's heart rate would be 300 beats per minute, okay? If it happened to land right on the next box, we would say 150. So hopefully that makes sense how you can use the big box method to determine the patient's heart rate if they are in a regular rhythm. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Let's move on now to the six second method. Now this method really uses that idea that 30 big boxes is six seconds of time. And if we can determine how many beats or how many cardiac cycles occurred within six seconds and multiply it by 10, we've got the patient's heart rate in beats per minute. Now we can use the six second method on any EKG strip. It really, uh, it doesn't matter if the heart rate is regular or irregular. If the heart rate though is irregular in any way, we have to use this six second method and can't use the big box method. So it's pretty simple. What we're going to do is count the number of R to R intervals or technically the number of full cardiac cycles that occurs within six seconds or 30 boxes along the, the rate along the strip. And then what we're going to do is multiply that number by 10 and you have your rate. Simple as that. So let me show you in this example. Uh, here we've got a, a pretty rapid rhythm and we can say, okay, well from here to here is six seconds of time, 30 big boxes. And our R to R interval is a good way to determine the patient's uh, when a full cardiac cycle. Okay, R to R interval. So we can count those out and we can see here on this example we have 13 R to R intervals, meaning just more than 13 full cardiac cycles occurred within this patient's uh, six seconds. And so we do the math, 13 times 10, we've got 130 beats per minute. Okay, simple as that. Now, one important thing to understand though is, or, or a helpful tip anyways, that you can sometimes use depending on the machine that you're using. Uh, some machines will use, uh, mark out a tick every three seconds. And that's the case with this example I've shown you. So every three seconds on this rhythm strip, there's a line. So then it makes it really quick and easy to be able to decide where six seconds is. So let me go ahead and demonstrate this again with a couple of examples on an actual EKG paper one big box, okay, or these five millimeters, is 0.2 seconds, which means five of these big boxes will be one second, which means 30 big boxes will be six seconds. So we're gonna go ahead and count these out. I usually try to find there an area where there's a QRS, you know, a, a, a dark line and then a QRS complex, and I start counting on that dark line. So in this case, I'm gonna say here is zero, and I'm gonna count these out and go 30 boxes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Okay, so here's 30 boxes, which means from here 
to here is six seconds of time. All right. So then what we want to do is determine how many full cardiac cycles occurred within those six seconds. One quick way to do this is to just go R wave to R wave because one span from R wave to R wave is the equivalent of one cardiac cycle. We could also say from, you know, right between a T wave and a P wave to the next spot between a T wave and a P wave. That's one cardiac cycle. But it's quicker to go from R wave to R wave. So in this case, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, almost thirteen. Okay, so notice how this we started counting right before this QRS, and this one ends right, so the next QRS is right after it, so it technically, if we were to shift QRSs over onto those big boxes, we would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 full cardiac cycles. We want to do 13 times 10 to make this 60 seconds which means we've got 130 beats per minute on this EKG. All right, so what about this one? This one here, if you look at the regularity, it is irregularly irregular. Notice how this interval from R to R is not the same as here to here, which is not the same as here to here, okay? So we know this is an irregularly irregular rhythm, and this happens to be atrial fibrillation. So because it is an irregular rhythm, we have to use the six second method to determine rate. So notice this machine actually gives us three different rhythm strips to choose from. It's printed V1 out across the whole thing, lead two out across the whole thing, and V5 across the whole thing. So we can use any of these. It's the same duration of time, same events happening. We just choose whichever one we want. In this case, I'm gonna use V5 because it's down here right at the bottom. All right, there you go. There's our 30 boxes, six seconds of time. We wanna count out our R to R intervals now, or our full cycles. All right, there we go. So we have 12 full R to R intervals. Notice how it's just more than 12. We're gonna go ahead and count it as just 12. So we've got 12 times 10 equals 120 beats per minute. All right, so here's another example. In this case, um, all we're getting is the rhythm strip. And like I mentioned earlier, remember those tick marks? Well, in this example, you see we have these tick marks. And so in this case, each tick mark is at three seconds, so we know this whole rhythm strip is six seconds. We don't need to worry about counting out our 30 boxes for this specific example. But uh, notice we've got a P wave, QRS, T wave, and the same. Um, they're further spread out though, and we're gonna use our six second method here again. Notice we've got one R to R interval, a second one, and a third one. So if we just went from R to R interval, we would maybe say that this was, okay, well, we've got three times 10, is this 30 beats per minute? Okay, we would be off a little bit if we were to say 30 because notice we kind of have about another half. So we could say we have three and a half in this situation and so we would maybe be more accurate to call this one 35 beats per minute. And so if, if you have more of a, a half of a cardiac cycle present towards the end, especially when we're dealing with bradycardia, go ahead and call it a half. Okay, well I've got three and a half or I've got four and a half in my 30 boxes, so I'm gonna go ahead and you know call it 3.5 rather than three. And that's going to give you a more accurate estimation of the patient's actual heart rate. All right, so that's the big box method and the six second method. Um, before we wrap things up, I wanna throw out a quick word of caution, okay? Sometimes, depending on the EKG machine, some of the older machines in particular, put little marks, little vertical stripes on the EKG between leads being printed on that machine. So let me show you what that might look like on this example. So in this example, you can see this is printing on this 12 lead, lead two, AVL, V2, and V5. And notice this machine puts a tick, a vertical line between the leads. So lead two, switching to AVL, there's a vertical line, another one here, okay? So those vertical lines do not make the mistake of mistaking those as R waves, okay? This example is pretty obvious those aren't R waves because you can see the R waves pretty clearly, but in other 
cases it's not as clear so make sure that you're focusing on that and making sure what you're counting is an R wave truly is an R wave and not just a line between two leads most of the newer EKG machines are actually putting a little gap in uh, the line so there's a discontinuation rather than that vertical line but something to keep in mind all right there we go regularity and rate I hope everything was clear please put any questions or comments down in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them if I can from episodes one, two, and three, you now have all the knowledge and skills you need to be able to identify the arrhythmias. We can take some of this knowledge and apply it in five steps. So let me show you what I mean. So step one would be determining the patient's regularity. Is it regular, irregularly irregular, or regularly irregular, okay? Step two then is determining the patient's heart rate. And I just showed you two simple methods to do that very quickly. Step three in identifying an arrhythmia is looking at the P waves to see if there are true P waves before each QRS complex and are they uniform, uh, upright with the, the, when they should be upright, and do they march out regularly. Okay, so we'll talk about that in the future. The fourth step is to look at the PR interval. The PR interval uh, being the time from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. And does that march out? Is it regular? And then step five, looking at the QRS complex. Is it wide or is it narrow? Narrow would be normal, so less than three little boxes. Or is it larger than that? Is it a prolonged widened QRS? So using these five steps now, moving forward into the next several episodes, we're going to talk about the different types of arrhythmias and how to identify them using these five steps that you now know. All right, well, that brings us to the end. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. That really helps me out. Please don't forget to hit subscribe, hit that little bell thing so that you get a notification every time I upload a new episode in this series. I'm also posting several other videos that I hope you find helpful. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you in episode four.